world of business. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to talk much because you're going to now experience something uh, that is part of our modern culture. It's called Adult Education by TED. And most of you will have watched a TED conference or certainly a part of uh, a TED conference online already. We have decided that this is uh, the absolute fantastic uh, form in which our next four speakers will deliver their presentations. It's all hands-on. It's all business-related. And I'd like to invite up on stage Dennis Vedakov, Michael Book, Peter Mann, and Ulf Valentin. And they are ready to rock and roll. They are here. They are running to the stage. <laughs> all right. Um, is at least one of them here? Ulf? Dennis? Well... Oh, there they are. Three out of four, I think that's a good beginning. Um, <laughs> maybe we can have a little bit of uh, an applause. It's absolutely fantastic. So the rules are, ladies and gentlemen, ten minutes for each person. Uh, you know, sign slam. Uh, this is uh, no more. And after, after ten minutes, you get slammed in the true sense of the word. Uh, Dennis, will you take it away? And uh, Dennis um, is, of course, speaking for Vodafone EOL, and uh, you're going to share your knowledge with us. Maybe you come here. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, yes, I'd like you to show how Vodafone integrates social CRM data to gain social insights for cross- and upselling. My name is Dennis Wedderkop. I am working for UL Group, and we are social media lead agency for Vodafone. So if you look at the social media activities uh, of Vodafone, you will see we have 500,000 fans. It's quite a good number. We had also last year 60 million impressions, 77,000 comments. Almost 77% of the um, comments had a positive segment. So we knew a little bit um, about the behavior of the social media users, but um, we knew a little how they act or behave as individuals. And as you all know, customer relationship um, management is always about individuals since we are speaking about relationships. So Vodafone from the history comes out of a privileged situation. In their history they almost knew at every time where, they, where their customers are, how much they spend time on their services and products, how much they spend money on, on Vodafone, but in social media and in Facebook, Vodafone didn't knew so much about the individuals. So we had to get them know better again through social media. And we looked deeper into Facebook since Facebook is the most important social media channel for Vodafone. And we've seen almost everything we were looking for is already there. In Germany, we have 23 million users at Facebook. Worldwide, it's 900 million, so we, we're speaking about the biggest database that keeps updating itself every day, every minute, every second since the beginning of human history. And Facebook shares, uh, collects of every user the interest graph and the social graph. With the interest graph, we can see what the users like, what they want, what they have. Every user has 80 preferences that he shares with Facebook. So only in Germany we are speaking about 2 billion preferences. This is big data. And we have also the social graph, so we see who, who, influence, uh, who, who influencing is somebody, how much friends does he have. So this is quite interesting for obviously every company. And we had to look how can we connect these data with, with our CRM. And I will show you three examples how Vodafone empowers the users um, to create entertaining content. I'm speaking about advertising, but you can adapt that also onto 
customer services, you can uh, adapt that through sales, so can, you can adapt that to human resources. So what we did is we wanted to enrich our CRM with social data. We did that, for example, with the Vodafone mobile internet test, a test where we ask users how fit are you for using mobile data. And he, he got up to seven questions. Each question became harder to answer. And depending on when he swept away, um, we knew a little bit about the affinity to the mobile, mobile web, uh, mobile, um, mobile data. And in the end, the user could register through Facebook Connect to enter a sweepstake. So we had on the first side affinity to mobile, mobile web, and on the second side Facebook, uh, Facebook data. A second example, we empowered the users to create a personal TV commercial out of their Facebook picture, so the user could register with their Facebook image to create um, a version, a personal version of the current Vodafone TV commercial. We even adopted this into the offline world where we rented a billboard at Berlin Kurfürstendamm where um, the users could even see offline on the big screen their face in, in the commercial. A last, um, a last example how we collected Facebook data was, was a real-time event. This Christmas from the 1st to the 24th December we um, played a live quiz with a real TV um, moderator who was asking the question. It was a, a kind of format like one against 100. And uh, we asked the users end of November, when do you want to play a real-time game? They, asked, uh, they answered us 8 p.m. So every day from the 1st to the 24th December, we had this show. And this became the month with the highest engagement uh, at Vodafone of all time since yet. So out of the users, we took 1,500 tokens and entered them into MicroStrategy Wisdom. And we got some interesting, surprising results on this side. Um, for example, we've seen five of the top ten pages that the users we are liking who, who are using the Vodafone live quiz. There are TV shows that ran on Pro7. So we got lots of insights that affected our media strategy and gave us new, new ideas how to think about spending media. Another very interesting thing for us was um, we looked at the people who also liked Te Deutsche Telekom and O2 Deutschland, who are obviously the competitors of Vodafone Deutschland, and have seen that there is a lot higher affinity to Vodafone at the telecom fans than on the O2 fans. We did another analyze, analysis. Um, we took 240,000 leads out of every social campaign that we have ran and compared them to 20, 240 1,000 uh, average Vodafone users from the data warehouse and got astonishing results like um, the average Facebook user has 200% higher average revenue per user. He is using much more um, voice and data. He is also um, twice as often contract user, so he doesn't um, use prepaid tariffs with, within Vodafone. He is... Um, more than uh, has a more than 50% higher um, lifetime, and every everything we, we've analyzed um, became higher than the average user. So also mobility rate, uh, net promoter score. What did we learn? Um, at first, um, we have much deeper customer insights that can enrich our imperfect CRM data. We have lower wasted coverage through we knew the users better, so we have um, better targeting opportunities. And last but not least, we have qualitative and quantitative ad evidence that Facebook fans are highly valuable. What do we think is next? Um, 
which will still increase even though Facebook has 23 million users in Germany, Vodafone has 32, so um, we still still potential in there. Location-based and mobile data will increase since uh, Facebook has already 50% mobile users. They just acquired Instagram and Vodafone as mobile operator, um, of course, is very interested in in combining these data also for their services. And last but not least, we will see even more preferences due to verb-driven um, language with Facebook announced uh, this January in New York. So we also knew what do the users want, what do, you, do, do the users want to sell, and something like that. Thank you. Absolutely fantastic. My heart goes out to you, and I'm going to be quick again because you've just saved us one minute. The next gentleman um, has already been mentioned today. It's Michael for Dell, uh, not Michael Dell, but Michael Buck. And um, you're going to show us a presentation. And of course, during the presentation, I actually should uh, do something like that so that we don't see the apple. Um, I hope that you can live with it, and your presentation will be started in a minute. And yes, that's so I don't have to do it. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, just to share with you, uh, he started the stopwatch, and you have another 30, 30 seconds in addition. Great, excellent. Thanks very much, and thanks for having me. Um, I'm uh, Michael Buck. I lead the uh, global online marketing organization for Dell, and uh, in fact, I, I just left Dell three days ago, so um, that's the news <laughs> of the day, and uh, I have one uh, objective um, uh, for, this, for this 10 minutes. I would like to have more tweets than Brian Solis this morning, so you all can help me um, and uh, tweet like hell. Now, the story is, is very simple, and that's why 10 minutes is actually a good time. The, the story about Dell and social media is really about pioneering. And uh, we do this in seven years. We are in social media since roughly seven years. We feel like we're pioneers. We're starting all over pretty much every quarter because the story is changing. So if you feel like you are a pioneer, you don't understand, you know, welcome to the club. I think everybody's in the same ballpark. Um, this is my ex-boss. He started the company 28 years ago with a thousand bucks. Um, doing quite well. CEO still and chairman of uh, the company. 60 billion dollars of revenue and 110,000 employees. I would say he's probably one of the single biggest reasons why social media and Dell are a success story because he founded the company with two premises. One was a direct relationship with a customer and the second was really a customized product for each and every customer. And Think about this. Social media really enables him to accomplish at least the first one because on a scalable basis, you can have a much deeper relationship with your customer through social media than before social media. And that's why it's so close to the DNA of a company like Dell. That's what he says about social media. And quite frankly, I could speak 10 minutes about that little post from Michael Dell alone. Connect more closely with our customers. That's pretty much all about uh, the objective you need to know. And the trick is, of course, how do you enable an organization? How do you make it happen? And I wish we had that idea ourselves. Uh, we were kind of forced into that idea by unsatisfied um, customers. And we had to do something because we did something wrong. The learning was, of course, a dialogue. The learning was, of course, um, to uh, engage with the blogosphere and engage within social media and start that journey. And most of you know that journey, so I will not talk too much about that part. Now, that was not really an option for us, uh, and I cannot really recommend this as a strategy for you either. Um, it really only works short term. Um, long term, it's certainly not a good way of doing this. He's walking the talk. Uh, Michael is really walking the talk. He is uh, actually... If I may, uh, just a good excuse of getting closer to you. Thank you. Another tweet, please. Thank you. Um, he, he, he's, he's walking the talk, which means he's the reason. He's really... Authentic when he is out there, um, it's him. It's not a ghostwriter or speechwriter, which makes it extremely uh, positive for the employees because they see trust in them doing it. And that trust is really something, uh, you heard it this morning, trust is really a big, big component of this. And it's not only trust from your customers, it's actually trust from your employees that it's okay to talk about the company and it's okay to talk about the products and services and customers uh, without being a, a PR manager. And that's the trust he's living in that company. Now, this is really something where if I look at some of the Facebook uh, approaches uh, companies are using, it looks like this. 
it's the big muscle. It's the monologue about why we are so good. And uh, I think that's really where you see all these shitstorms mentioned this morning happening. Is, is really, if this is a muscle, uh, then use that muscle um, more in the upper part and listen to your customers, not so much in the bottom part. And from that perspective, your customers are calling you out. Your customers are calling you out. And I can tell you, Scott mentioned conversion this morning. The single biggest conversion up or down factor is how you react to bad feedback. If you react negatively to bad feedback from your customers, this is an absolute conversion decrease. It's actually worse than if the products are uh, you know, not really reviewed in a positive way. And that's something you need to remember. The camera is always on for you as a brand. The camera is always on for you as a company. And if you misbehave or if you don't accept that feedback and take it and run with it, then people will actually call you out. Now, a lot of clients, a lot of customers uh, I'm, I'm speaking with, uh, they don't understand that social media is also a Pandora's box. What does that mean? That means if you open it, it's your right to open it. It's your right to experiment. It's your right to use it as a business. But you have to know, Pandora's box in this case is only something your, cu your clients, your customers are closing. It's not you. If you open it, you have to live with the consequence. And that means the feedback which comes in goes into the company. You cannot just ignore it. And that's why it's very important, and I think Brian said it this morning, if you are going that, down that path, be prepared that Pandora's box stays open. Because your clients will talk about your brand because it's their brand as well. And you know all the statistics about 60% of, of, of customers are actually talking about brand, 40%, 30% is only something we as a brand, uh, you know, allow ourselves to talk about, you know, our brand. So ultimately, the majority of time, our clients and interested people are talking about you. And, you know, if you're not prepared, if Pandora's box stays closed, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It still happens because customers still talk about you. And they talk about your products, your services, and they talk about you as somebody not receiving that feedback. We have an infrastructure in place, and it's proven to be even more successful. This is now in place, the command center, uh, since probably uh, short of two years. This is an infrastructure, how you manage big data. And it's not necessarily the tool itself. For those of you who don't know what this is, this is people in 14 languages listen to what customers have to say or people in the net have to say. 27,000 times a day across 166 countries worldwide. The crux of this is how do you actually take that information and bring it to the right people, to the right leaders in the company to do something with it. So the process of establishing a listening process is not really the big problem. The big problem is what do you do with it and how do you establish routine processes in order to really facilitate the dialogue with your customers. Now, this is an interesting view. You know, I'm a, I'm a marketing person, and uh, Brian Solis in, the, in a press interview just uh, this morning talked about the shitty marketing people, and I'm one of those shitty marketing people. And I can tell you, I thought I know what our customers want. We paid the right-hand uh, video with an agency, really expensive, and what we realized is actually that the views are more on the left side. This is really somebody on the couch producing the same type of video which means you have no idea what your customers are really interested in, you have no idea what's viral, and you have no idea what's funny. They know what's funny, your customers do. And in this case, you have to trust the process that your customers can really live with that information and do a better job than most of us as marketeers. Now, what you need is a, an ecosystem, an ecosystem in, in, in the best possible sense. You need an external ecosystem which is all about listening, infrastructure to really understand what customers are needing. And you need an extra, an internal uh, uh, ecosystem which really shows you what to do with this information. It's a very complicated beast, but I can tell you it's worth investing because if you don't have it, you will soon be hit by this big data stream and you have no idea what to do with it and your people are not trained. Speaking of that, fish where the fish are means Dell.com is a great place. We've changed Dell.com a lot of times. Dell.com is not the place where our customers spend the majority of their time. We have to be much, much better in our presence in physical stores and in other places like Facebook and Twitter in order to really have an impression on our customers. It's great if you spend all your marketing money on your own infrastructure. Please don't, don't forget that 
Customers are spending time, much, much more time outside. Content is king. No, content is queen. Listening is queen. Relevance is, 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 is king because it might be content you have, which is great, but that content might not resonate with your customers. So for us, listening is king, content is queen, and if you max it, then you have the relevant information at the relevant place with the relevant people. Um, and to me, that's really the right recipe. And last but not least, uh, you have to bring your people with you. Uh, to, to Dell, the employees are the biggest, the single biggest asset in whatever we do. We have trained 15,000 people by now in social media, and that means that jobs are changing. Our PR manager changes. Our engineering manager changes. We have a chief listening officer. A chief listening officer, that's a functionality which makes sure that we are listening. And you know what? I mean, people laugh about that, but this is a, a pretty close to the board type of functionality where you can change things. They can change my metrics. They can change my success metrics and many, many more things. And with this, I really thank you. And I hope I'll check my Twitter account uh, if I got more than Brian Solis. But if not, you have some homework to do. Thanks very much. That was absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much uh, for sharing, Michael. And we all wish you, uh, wherever you're going, uh, really good uh, luck and a lot of success, which you've already had in the past and fantastic uh, uh, presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, um, there was a time when a poster was enough uh, to recruit some people into the army. And it said, your country needs you. Uh, I think methods have ch changed slightly. And this young man, Peter Mann, uh, is uh, representing CDS, uh, in other words, also the UK Army. You're going to show us how it's done today, right? Hopefully. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Hey, good afternoon. Indeed, my name is Peter Mann. I come from a business called CDS. Uh, we're a digital agency that work for a number of uh, businesses, but one of my primary customers is the British Army. Um, We've been working for them for about five years in a variety of ways in terms of their websites and their social media uh, as of today uh, inside Facebook and Twitter and everything else. Uh, but today I want to focus on uh, some of our latest work uh, with MicroStrategy software. And my mission um, today is to demonstrate how we're taking the theory into practice uh, and delivering what is social CRM for a very specific app, in this case, recruitment. So our goal... Uh, is straightforward. We need to take a gang of useless reprobates and turn them into fabulous socially engaged soldiers. Okay? We have a whole bunch of specific objectives within that, but they're unique to the campaign. I don't need to dwell on them. All as marketeers, you have your own specific objectives, but we need to obviously hit for our client a series of goals within that single overall objective. So in terms of method, how are we going to approach that? Okay, so it begins with listening, as we've heard about today, it, gets, it begins with understanding who are our potential candidates out there, of which we're dealing with on average 100,000 in every single cycle uh, of recruitment and every kind of phase. We need to know as much as we can about them, both from good and bad reasons. The bad reasons, as you've come to see, is one of our most interesting goals, is we actually typically have no problem attracting interest, but what we do have a problem with is attracting the interest from the right candidates as opposed to the wrong ones. Is that better? Sorry about that. I hope I get 30 seconds extra now. No. So our second goal. <laughs> so once we understand the individuals we're talking about, we then need to understand the community that they're working with. And you saw a great demo of the wisdom tool that we would use to achieve that. We need to understand the peer group and the community. They are the biggest influences of a young person's choices about recruitment. Finally, then, we obviously now need to communicate with them. And again, we're going to be using similar technology to that. You've already seen a demo uh, within the FC Barcelona presentation. But we need to be able to communicate, them, communicate with them on multiple levels because we know what success looks like. That begins with broadcast messaging when we don't know anything about them or very little, all the way through to local and hyper-local communication as we know more and more about the person, all through one channel. Okay? And the final component, of course, of any marketing communication and plan is we obviously have to have the content but obviously we're in a conversational medium we need to take people on a journey we need to keep people within that journey which can typically take nine or more months to achieve from gate one to the end so we really do need to engage and maintain a conversation 
So implementation, what does that now look like? How are we taking that forward? We use a method just to give it a name called Halo Content. And that means we need to influence or nudge behavior for all of those nudge scientists out there through a targeted sales pipeline style of approach because we have very clear goals here. We have an outcome we need to achieve and we need to do that via matching those stages with the appropriate content to achieve those goals to nudge that behavior over time. We're not simply selling something. We obviously, are, uh, the decision to apply to join the army is a fairly materially large decision. That does not happen in 24 hours. The inspiration, if you're wondering, is we have to do a lot of work for uh, the automotive industry, and they would term this halo or halo cars or halo management, and that's how they attract attention to their brand, define their brand, and build loyalty over time. So we're mimicking something we've learned elsewhere. So what are the stages? Again, we have four clear stages that we're trying to work through to achieve these goals and to achieve a plan with our customer here. It began with understanding what is today, what are we doing right now, and we were able to model this as a simplification of a straightforward current pipeline of engagement, which is broadcast. So we're talking about trying to communicate with as many people as possible. So we've got 100,000 in the top, and if we're very, very lucky on a great day, we might end up with, after a year of effort, 1% who might actually be valid candidates. Not soldiers can actually be valid candidates that can be taken through. So that's the current position. We then look at utopia. What are we trying to achieve? And again, this is a simplified version of that. But our utopia is all about actually fundamentally removing inappropriate people from the pipeline as fast as possible. And then with those people who are appropriate, filtering them down to get them to be in contact with the right pieces of content and the right people to match their skills, their education level, their potential desired career, whether that be medical, engineering, or shooting at stuff. Okay. Once we know what our utopian position is, we're then in a position to start looking at this nudge uh, approach. What different experiences, what pieces of content is an individual going to need to experience? Because it is needs-based, of course. The army has to do certain things uh, to encourage people, but equally the candidate also has to do certain things to qualify themselves into the process. Uh, I don't, you don't need to read every gate, but as you can see, we know there are a minimum of 10 specific gates that an individual will need to work through before we can actually take them through as to be a, a potential soldier. Okay? Finally, then we can implement. Okay? And that means understanding those gates, planning the content around it, creating the right messages and the right content in all the different formats that, that might be, including human response content, your know, live FAQs. I'm talking about every potential piece of content that might reach someone. We need to make sure that content can get out there. It can be curated. It can go viral in that sense. People can talk about it and expose it and everything we understand about social. And then fundamentally, we obviously need to be able to react, uh, much like shopping cart planning in the, in the 90s and, and trying to understand why are people dropping out, where are we going wrong, we can monitor the same process through these tools. Why are we losing potentially valid candidates, say at month four, after content delivery item, whatever it might be, or a certain online event, or whatever we might have been doing. Okay? So that's the method we were following. Okay? And yes, we do a lot of testing to make sure that our methods are appropriate before we actually go execute. In terms of how that's now looking, uh, we are very much about to go live with the latest version of this, but I can give you a sort of a sense and beta of sort of the things that we're doing. Okay, so a candidate would experience, obviously, content, an application in a certain way, whether it be mobile or other forms. Um, we're looking to be able to deliver that right content. Images, in the same way that you saw offers about your know, shirt for a soccer mom, we're talking about images of, uh, well, we know, for instance, female, potential female candidates are more interested or respond better to pictures of the army in humanitarian roles, whereas younger males, guess what? They kind of like seeing, again, people blowing stuff up, right? That's appealing to them, okay? Surprise, surprise. Um, we know that it is vital to be able to appeal to educated, higher educated people, people who are plausibly in university or have been in university, and we also get onto the levels of potential officer recruitment and everything else, we can look at delivering the right types of offers again, the right type of events or materials based on the candidate profile. Um, and these are simple things we can get from wisdom in that sense. Okay? We're then looking at taking them through that pipeline, looking at offering them specific events, invitation-only events, again, offering something a little bit special to potential officers, right enough. We don't particularly have a problem with getting infantry. We do have a problem with officers. Okay? So we can keep those private events in there if we need to. 
Okay? We also know, as I mentioned, we have to keep people in the pipeline for a significant period of time. Another thing we love about the mechanisms and alert is we can put any kind of media in there, and that includes looking at gaming and gamification to keep people coming back. We need people coming in, hopefully every month or certainly once every two months, to keep that engagement and keep them hopefully in the pipeline all the way through to month nine or month ten. Okay? Uh, and just another example of that, we like the multimedia. Uh, aspect. We put videos and a link through to YouTube in there. And mobile, yes, it's coming. Okay, so finally, results. Why Facebook? Why is Facebook becoming number one? I do mean number one. It will predominate over TV and everything over the next 12 to 24 months for Army, which is a massive, massive change. Fundamentally, the Army is socially engaged. We have a significant body of fans within our pipeline with a significant number interested in engaging with us. We know recruitment itself, as we all would know, is a high-stress, high-value, high, highly social type of decision that we make anyway. Who wouldn't ask their friends or colleagues about f fundamental jobs? And equally, on the flip side, what employer wouldn't be interested in the data and who wouldn't? And, uh, and one final fascinating stat just to show the speed of growth is in, in 2010, 60% of all of our upstream traffic to our recruitment uh, application forms directly came from Google. 60% in 2011 came from Facebook searches and links. That's how fast it was. Okay. Um, and just for speed, finally results, because uh, they're already in in terms of the Facebook work we've done, four quick points. Quantity. Quantity is clearly better in Facebook. We're talking a roughly a tripling of in terms of people who choose to actually start handing over data items, some kind of data exchange that goes on. It's tripled through Facebook in comparison to our online forums, our websites, uh, our online forums, and other things that the Army has had over the years. Okay, quality. This is a fascinating point, which is our key goal. Uh, we just flipped TV ads to initially, they directed to the public website, you know, army.com in effect. Uh, and then those TV ads flipped to point to facebook.com forward slash army. In that single difference, as you can see, we recorded near a 50% improvement in candidate quality. That is, the people who applied were on average 50% more likely to be valid potential recruits than in the previous method. And that was put down almost 100% to the fact that going through Facebook, the peer group basically told you you weren't going to make it, in effect. People had sensible conversations about their friends and said, you haven't got the right stuff, don't kid yourself, don't bother. So they filtered themselves out before we wasted time and money on them. It's been highly disruptive. Uh, from October, we'll be engaging with all of their call centers and outsource. This is a big, big exercise. Their call centers, their marketing and ops teams to directly bake in the Facebook part of the recruitment cycle into the core offline cycle. So this is fundamentally disruptive to their business. And yeah, final point. It has been inspiring. The marketing teams, the comms teams, and the generals and everyone else involved have uh, opened their eyes to the possibilities. And one example, finally, I'll give you is the fact that they're looking at targeting parents. You know, you'd never consider targeting parents, but they are cl clearly key influencers in that decision. And we can look at sending out specific content, much like the soccer mum thing. We can look at potential army mum and send her content to hopefully make her feel a little better about a son going off to get shot at. So that's me. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much, Peter, especially for that last uh, very realistic remark. Uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to number four uh, in our quartet. And uh, if you, ladies and gentlemen, have been playing your cards right, then you will have engaged uh, the services of HRS uh, when you were coming uh, to this Congress because you would have done the booking through HRS and you could have saved up to Ulf. More than 30%. More than 30% on your room rate. So that yeah. was the entry and uh, I you. think sort of the pre-sales. Now you've got to do the sales. Thank you for Thank the you. introduction. Hello, everybody. My name is Ulf Valentine um, and I'm in charge of social media by HRS. And uh, I think it's uh, good to know that I'm working in the brand department. So it's not located in the public relations department. It's... Uh, at the brand department. And what I want to talk about uh, today is the impact of social media. Um, if we take a recap, and this was something we talked about this conference um, as well, is what is the development of social media? If we go back a few years, um, the marketeer came up to the social media guru and said, okay, it's, there's a hype, the social media hype, should I be part of it? And he would say, yes, that's the next big thing. You have to take part of it. Um, the next year, maybe the marketeer would say, yeah, I'm, I'm on Facebook and uh, we, we publish our press releases on Twitter, so 
but is it really what I want to do? Is this really what, what is useful or should I step and go, go out because the hype is over? And the social media guru would say, no, um, you have to be in the social web because everyone is talking about you and you, you have to be there. Okay, the marketeer goes on and the next year the door goes open and the boss stands in the door and says, okay, where's the money? So basically that's the point where uh, marketeers as, as me stand there and, and see, okay, what is the real impact of social media and uh, what can I do to, to uh, find arguments and make social media uh, the way we want to do it and base our strategy on it. So I think the first thing is measurement. Measure the social media uh, engagement you do. First thing is reach. It's pretty simple. Um, everything you do um, is in the social web makes impressions, makes visits, uh, your page posts, and all the stuff. <coughs> you can uh, measure it, and there's uh, a, a nice posting from Ignite Social Media, um, and they made something. It's called like social media equivalence, so you can compare it to other media channels. Um, it's not the best thing to compare social media to other social media, so to, to other, uh, with other channels like online marketing, but it gives you an impression and it shows you a little bit like what uh, reach can I get when I use social media. So that's the first thing. If you do this homework and you say, okay, I can measure what is my reach, okay, perfect. The second more valuable KPI and for me the most valuable one is the performance thing. You can measure two things, the direct impact and the indirect impact. The direct impact is if you make a posting, if you are active on different social media channels and you have a link placed there, and there's a tracking link there, you can see directly the impact on your website. You can see what is the customer, what is the user, the fan doing on my brand website. Um, and that's uh, really good to know because maybe um, I have to, to do something uh, more inspiring content or I have to lead them a better way. That's, that's a good thing. Another good thing is the indirect traffic, the organic, call it organic um, measurement. You can see it there. It's the referral traffic, the upstream, upstream and downstream traffic. How many people come from Facebook, Pinterest? Where do they come from? In our case, uh, the Pinterest referral traffic uh, is, is more than the Twitter uh, referral traffic now. So that's interesting to see. And this gives me hard facts about how effective is my social media work. If you do this really good and um, you, you make sales, for example, uh, via social media, um, uh, your social media engagement, uh, for example, F-commerce or something like that, then you are really good. But I think, again, the marketeers stand there um, and have to decide um, what is the real impact of social media. If it's not significant, what I can measure with this performance metrics, maybe I have to take another metric. And that's, in this case, often engagement. Engagement is nice because there's no other um, KPI, which is comparable with this in the media world. And uh, engagement is something which is not really, you cannot really touch it. So, but engagement is, is two things. If you have a good engagement with your customers and with your fans, followers, um, you, have, you can widen your reach and you spread the word about your brand, about the messages you want to place. Then it comes to that point that you see this topic advocacy. So maybe if people spread the world around the, about, you, uh, about your brand, they are advocates of your brand. Uh, and often they are seen as this picture shows people walking around um, showing your ad. So, but that's not really the way we see our customers, or is it? And then, as we saw, the dinosaur marketing funnel um, adds a new level. It's called a quote, uh, advocacy. And this leads to more awareness and should lead to more people coming in the funnel and finally um, being your customer. But is this really the view we should take? I don't think so. And if you see this guy's uh, walking around, if you have a close look at the customer journey, then you will see that there is an abrupt ending. If the people, if the customers, the users going through the social web and you get contact with them, you engage them in, through inspiring content, through um, your engagement, through a community management. And the people come to your brand websites, they're often standing there and don't know what to do because 
there's a huge gap between what is my social environment and what is the brand giving me. So um, what I want to take you home is, what, what we figured out is that you make a seamless experience. That's the thing you should do. This is an, an autobahn bridge which combines two uh, forests and so that the animals can go over the autobahn without leaving their environment. And this is how it should be, how um, uh, Brian Solis said, it's the connected customer you should always take with you when you look at the customer journey. So that's the thing we do, deep a clo close look at the customer journey, what is he doing, and try to, all the social media experience, social experience the customer has in his journey, take it to your brand. Whether it's in the social web or on your website, but that's where you have to start, and then, you get the social media impact in full effect. Because before that, the customer is standing there and don't know really what to do. So that's what I want to say. Thank you. Well, that's absolutely fantastic. Three minutes saved. Um, yeah. That's almost worth a kiss, but uh, we'll do that afterwards. Uh, <laughs> okay. To save some time right at the moment. Thank you very much.